Next, we've got uh, Sylvia Blemker coming up to discuss how can multi-scale modeling benefit the female athlete, a professor of biomedical engineering at UVA and awardee of one of the inaugural Wusai Alliance Agility pro Projects. I'm excited to be here today. Um, thank you for that introduction, and I'm excited to share with you some of our work uh, related to the Female Athlete uh, Project and specifically the uh, and in general to the Wusai Alliance. Um, I wanted to kind of acknowledge for two reasons. Um, I'm here representing University of Virginia, but I also work as a CSO at Springbok Analytics, uh, which is an early stage company uh, translating some image-based modeling software. Um, so, uh, um, what much I think what inspires this uh, alliance is the fact that human performance um, is really dictated by a really complex set of biology and mechanics principles that we're still scratching the surface of. I think Scott said that nicely this morning. A lot is yet to be discovered about uh, the sort of uh, the relationship between what we observe of an athlete at the whole body level in terms of athletic um, uh, performance all the way down to uh, bi biochemical and molecular factors. And for me personally, I'm fascinated by the underlying science behind that uh, relationship between molecular, cellular tissue, and, and whole body. But uh, the thing that uh, really also uh, inspires me but also troubles me and uh, gets me worried is the fact that uh, sex-specific differences um, uh, uh, come up at all of these levels. Uh, male and female um, uh, uh, have variety of uh, differences related to overall movement coordination, even fundamental uh, studies that show that running mechanics difference be differs between males and females, uh, muscular level factors, uh, and uh, down to cellular factors and uh, impact of things like estrogen. So they uh, pervade across all of these length scales. So, um, you know, you could see this in two ways. You could say, well, this is an opportunity to really uh, better understand how sex-specific uh, differences, sex differences, um, hormone differences, things like that, impact performance and modeling can really help you understand that and a, an interdisciplinary approach can really get there. But on the flip side, it also gets me scared because how much of our work doesn't incorporate that? Uh, based on the things that um, were just discussed in the talk before us, a lot of our knowledge is based on the literature that's been coming to date, and we just saw those statistics. Very much of the um, history of sports science, um, exercise physiology, was based on studies of just men or male rats or male mice or whatever. Um, you know, to keep things simple, but uh, how much are we missing that's not included in, our co in both our conceptual models but also um, computational models? Um, so I'm just going to talk about a couple of things that we're doing in my lab and a little bit at Springbok uh, related to those questions. So first one, uh, it, it, and I wanted to draw this uh, together with some of the different projects that are being talked about with the, the, the Alliance. The first one is whole body movement. So uh, models of, of, of movement mechanics are based on uh, representations of the lower extremity, right? Um, and you know, we see these models a lot. Um, and so some of the challenges that it actually, if you look at the musculoskeletal structure, it's based on the anatomy of, I think, approximately 5'10 man, right? About, yeah, um, which is great. And it's been, you know, uh, it's been used a lot. I'm not trying to, to downplay the model itself, but it's based on a limited set of anatomical data that's based on, on a male. Um, then over the years, it's been advanced in many ways, including more and more data, but that data ends up being sort of an amalgamation co uh, combination of, of data sets that are maybe from all male studies or, all, uh, or a mixture of them, but it's a sort of amalgamation of those things in a way that you can't really dissect differences. Um, includes both cadaver and in vivo data, which has its uh, own set of um, issues. And then the other, other issue that um, I think um, is discussed in various ways and how we scale these models to represent lots of different body types, BMIs, heights, and weights. There's still a lot to go there. And the, all those things um, mean that um, it's very hard to then say that we can actually model a female or a male. So, I mean, I would argue that we at least need a unique female and male model, right? Um, and uh, so that's one thing that we're working on in our lab, Im imagining not having one generalized model, at least having a different model for each. Um, and so some of the challenges with that and going there is a lot of it's the existing data. 
Um, we still have uh, the data sets that exist that do start to look at the differences between male and female. They're relatively uh, focused on specific regions and structures. So if you imagine putting those together, you might now be um, sort of amalgamating things, um, uh, put thing, putting things together in ways that may or may not be representative. Uh, and of course, scaling across people confounds these differences. Men are taller than women in general. <laughs> so uh, uh, that also impacts a lot of these things. So how do you appropriately account for that while dissecting out the differences? Um, and so, and the last thing, and I will say that I am included in this, some of my prior research, studies that have been done uh, to collect data needed for these models are usually not powered to actually associate, to really test sex differences. We haven't been thinking about that in our study design, so maybe we'll look at it as an afterthought, but, may, but lo and behold, you don't see much of a difference. It's because you haven't actually designed it to do that. So, and I'm, I'm in that boat myself, so. <laughs> um, so we're trying to change that. So uh, this is a project going on in my lab where we're, um, we're doing a combination of things. We're using MRI to get as much information we can about muscles, bones, uh, muscle architecture, kind of all the details of the musculoskeletal system, incorporating uh, strength measurements across the entire lower extremity to really make sure that our models are appropriately representing uh, the strength capacity of muscles and also incorporating motion capture to do appropriate scaling of uh, models. In uh, 50 uh, males and females, appropriately designing it so we're looking at the range of heights and masses and BMIs that are representative. Uh, so it's a pretty large data collection uh, exercise but I think one that's actually really needed if we want to get at having uh, sex-specific models. Um, and so uh, fortunately, the NIH agreed to, to help us pay for it. So that's good. Um, uh, so um, I thought I would just give you a little snapshot of the types of things we see, because there's, this is an ongoing big project. But maybe to kind of uh, talk about a couple muscles, because I do love my muscles. <laughs> Um, so, oh, so the first step I was going to mention, I was going to, the MRI part, uh, we collect images of the whole lower extremity, um, and uh, in doing this, uh, we, you have to identify each muscle, because the, you have all the muscles of the lower extremity, generate a 3D reconstruction. Uh, so this takes a lot of time, and so this is one where thing where AI has really helped us out a lot. So over the years, we've done these MRI-based muscle assessments for a long time that get, uh, gathered the necessary training data set, many uh, thousands of hours, uh, informing uh, a neural net-based approach uh, that is now led us to the point where we can actually take an MRI, quantify all the muscles, and, uh, and with a little bit of user input and get that done in, in less than an hour. And that's really empowering a larger scale, scale study like this. And so that is actually happening at, at Springbok. It's a technology that's now been commercialized. Um, so a couple of things. So the psoas, um, it it's, was my original favorite muscle. So I thought I would start with that one. <laughs> uh, so how does that differ between males and females? So it's a hip flexor, um, also uh, you know, attaches to the, to the vertebrae. So it's a very interesting muscle um, for multiple reasons, uh, important for many things. So what we're looking up, looking at on the left here is how, just how big that muscle is, its volume, um, as a function of the product and height and mass. Over the years, we found that, uh, that those two uh, parameters together actually best predict uh, muscle volume. And so males and females there. So one thing that you'll note, of course, the blue dots are to the right of the pink dots, right? Makes sense. Uh, uh, within a healthy range, um, males bigger and, and, and taller than females. So um, the thing, so then if you look at an unnormalized value, of course the blue, the males are bigger than the females. Yes, lo and behold. And actually when you look in the literature, you, I will not tell you how many times people conclude that they're different and they just do it this way, with not accounting for body size. It drives me bonkers. It's like, well, ah, uh, duh, right? <laughs> but then uh, if you go and you normalize, here we normalize by the product of height and mass, um, the differences are still, uh, there still exists, they're much less. So there is actually a, statistic, a statistically difference uh, in uh, normalized volume of the psoas. It tends to be larger in males than females. So that's interesting and now accounting for. So the functional consequence of that and how you would incorporate that into a model, those are all interesting questions that I think must be answered if we want to really start addressing the female athlete. Well, what about the soleus? Uh, Katie Knaus has made me almost think the soleus is cooler than the psoas, but I don't know. <laughs> uh, um, so this, uh, now we're looking at a similar plot. Again, you know, the blue dots are to the right of the, uh, are, are to the pink dots, they, they are bigger. And of course, when you look at it that way, unnormalized, still blue is 
bigger than pig, of course, but when you normalize it, it goes the other way. So it turns out in women, the soleus muscle is relatively bigger than uh, in, in, uh, in, in men. Um, so that's also very interesting, right? Because it turns out actually when you sum up all the muscles in the lower extremity and you normalize for height and mass, there isn't a difference. Um, or at least we haven't been finding it. And this, I will say this is a, a data collection exercise that's not done. I'm giving you a sneak peek, but I feel like we have enough points to start to make some insight. So then, um, so it's really the distribution of muscle that seems to be different, at least in this um, uh, cohort average, sort of average healthy cohort that we're studying. Uh, on the left here, um, this, this plot you see like the pink bars to left mean that those tend to be relatively bigger in the females and the blue dark, uh, to the right. There's interesting differences. For example, biceps femoris long head tends to be bigger in the females, uh, biceps femoris short head bigger in the males. So it's just an interesting thing to think about, for example, hamstring injuries. I believe there's more, they're more common in, in uh, male, uh, males and females, which is kind of interesting. Um, so um, again, the functional consequences of this, uh, that's, uh, we're, we're starting to do that modeling in the lab, but I hope as, as in this data set that we're collecting is gonna be um, open source and shared with the community so that others can start to ask questions about how this matters and how that intersects with other things. Um, so just a uh, final snapshot, I would mention uh, uh, back to our multi-scale, the, actually the um, project that we have for our agility project um, is actually at a smaller scale and it relates back into the, um, uh, the regenerative medicine kind of moonshot or thing, right, project moonshot. Uh, <laughs> uh, and we're really interested at the cellular level how estrogen influences muscle regeneration. So it turns out that um, uh, at normal estrogen levels, uh, because there are estrogen receptors on many of the cells in involved in muscle regeneration, um, we have uh, healthy muscle regeneration. But in, the, in uh, low estrogen levels, for a variety of reasons, whether they're low, uh, you end up with impaired regeneration. And, uh, and in some cases, instead of um, maybe delayed regeneration of muscle from an injury or even uh, deposition of fat and, and fibrosis in a muscle. So we're um, in the middle of this project. Um, and so with modeling in mind, because we want to incorporate everything, uh, we have uh, a student is developing this agent-based model of muscle regeneration that incorporates a lot of things, um, especially the ability to model how systemic factors influence uh, regeneration at the local level. And she's combining that with very detailed experiments to look to deliver estrogen at levels that are actually physiological. A lot of the studies have been out there. Look at estrogen impacts, but they put in so much in there that we're not even sure what it even means. Um, but then also coupling those experiments. So these are, it's an ongoing project, but I thought I would give you a snapshot of what we're doing there. Really trying to understand uh, estrogen, but also incorporating that into these detailed models. Uh, here's a real cool video of her model uh, regenerating, uh, which is very cool, where we see on the, on the top left is sort of what you would see, of a, those are pink muscle fibers. Uh, next to it is like the cellular interactions, uh, immune cells, uh, fibroblasts, stem cells, all kind of working together to do that. And then uh, the dis diffusion of various cytokines and growth factors that are involved in all of the cell signaling. Um, so with that, I just wanted to give another plug for um, the multi-scale modeling, but how uh, important but also impactful it would be if we can all really be thinking about sex differences as we do it. So with that, I will um, acknowledge my collaborators and thank you for your time.